Welcome to Since Time Immemorial, Tribal Sovereignty in Washington State. My name is Mrs. Brown, and I'm a history teacher in Seattle Public Schools. Today's lesson revolves around discrimination and how discrimination plays really a key role in the development of Washington State. And that sounds very, very odd, um, but it is the history I think that is really needed for us to be able to understand the way things are in our state and in our city. Today's lesson, I'm co-teaching with my colleague, Ms. German, and so you will hear both of us in today's lesson. So sit back, enjoy, and learn. So our goal today, by the end of this lesson, we want you to be able to explain how the local and state governments of Washington use discrimination as a tool to build the economy. And so as you're watching the lesson today, we want you to think about developing a position on whether we still have discrimination in Washington today. As you watch the lesson, you can start uh, collecting evidence to support your claim. You can either write down or uh, write down your argument or you can explain it and the supporting details that you learn about. Uh, you can explain it to somebody else. Please take it away, Ms. German. Hello, welcome to um, Distance Learning Washington State History with Ms. Jarman. Um, I have to tell you, we have um, some heavy stuff today. It's, it's not the happiest and it's not the proudest part of our history um, as Washingtonians. We are going to be talking about discrimination as it manifested in Washington State history. So last week we covered about 100 years worth of his, um, industry and development. And this week we're gonna kind of comb back over those same 100 years. We're gonna start a little later and end a little later, but basically those same 100 years. This time, like kind of with the, the big idea of discrimination and how that manifested in Washington state history. It's, um, it's a sad song, but we sing it anyway. It's, um, it's important to know this, it's important to own this, um, because it's gonna help us make sense of kind of where we are now as a state, maybe where we go from here. So I encourage you to pause and take breaks. It's gonna be kind of long. Um, it's gonna be kind of on the dark side. Maybe have somebody watch it with you so that you'll have someone to pause and, and talk about it with. And um, please, as always, message me if you have questions. All right, here we go. Let's start by taking a look at the word discrimination. Um, I've defined it here as a system of unfair treatment of different categories of people based on appearance or culture. It's kind of a, a more official version of what we might call racism. Discrimination, a system of unfair treatment of different categories of people based on appearance or culture. Let's take a look at the since time immemorial timeline. Now, if you've been with me all along, you will know that it's a spiral over here because the indigenous uh, native people who lived here thousands of years before white people came, um, they did not measure time in a line. They measured time in a spiral. It went with the seasons of the year and the seasonal rounds. So we, we think of it as a spiral back here. The piece of Washington state history that we're gonna be looking at today is relatively small compared to the millennia that folks have been here since time immemorial. It's gonna start, we're gonna start kind of like right here-ish. And when discrimination starts, um, basically when European descendants decide they wanna establish themselves here, they've been coming before to trade fur um, and such but in the 1840s, they decide they wanna establish themselves here. Some of you learned about the doctrine of discovery, the belief that they discovered this land and it must belong to them. And their inability to see the indigenous people as fully human 
who deserved this land, that's discrimination itself. And that's how it starts. And we've talked about what happens when you have a collision between um, people with land-based values who really see themselves as, as one with the earth and its resources, with people with Judeo-Christian values whose values command them to conquer the land and have dominion over it. Well, while they're conquering the land, you know, they, they conquer the indigenous people too while they're at it, and they don't really see them as fully human. That's what happened here. That's what happened a lot of places around this time. So colonist values take over. Native people are forced to give up their land and live on reservations. And so as land-based values are replaced with colonist values, and industry takes a strong hold um, between being on the reservations and assimilation the Native American people start to reorient themselves to the new system. So they're, they're not so much living by land-based values as, as much as they, they could or would because there's a new order now. So many of them are reorienting themselves and they're starting to take jobs on farms and factories. And these jobs with the, the many emerging industries in Washington state, along with the gold rush in California and later Alaska, starts to attract a lot more immigrants. And this time the immigrants aren't coming from the eastern part of the United States. They are coming from other continents. And pretty soon we've got a whole lot of humans who want dominion over the land. So what happens now? Are they all at the top? Who has dominion? Kind of everybody, but kind of not. It sorts itself pretty quickly into something like this. What do you notice? Let's zoom in on the timeline. This is roughly the period we're gonna be covering today. The boarding schools kind of started before this and were ongoing. Let's think about this person on top as maybe the original Judeo-Christian value folks who first showed up here as fur traders and missionaries and, um, and farmers and starters of the industries. And then let's look at everybody else as just kind of the people who came after them from other continents, the immigrants, and also the people who were here before them who um, kind of had to give up their way and assimilate to this way. And with this in mind, let's talk about discrimination in Washington state history. So as Ms. Jarman talked about earlier in this video, that um, another form of discrimination, another form of genocide was the Indian boarding school era. The policy was to kill the Indian and save the man. So imagine what that phrase means, to remove all of the Indian-ness, all of the Indian identity from children so that they can be assimilated and, and learn American culture and life ways. And what that does is create a superiority of white culture over native culture. This is one of the most shameful points in our history, and it happened in Washington state as well. Um, you can see here in this picture, there is a picture of Chiricahua children, and they, they are their first day at, at uh, Carlisle boarding school. You can see that at the top. Just a few months later, you can see how their entire culture and world was stripped from them, and not one of them are smiling. What do you think that means? So here are some boys working in the fields at Tulalip Indian Boarding School, and so does that look like a boarding school to you? I mean, take a look at the picture. Take a look at the young boys in the front 
in the front, the foreground of the photo, how old do you think they could possibly be? Take a look at the white people in the background, the woman holding her child and the, um, the other white farmer there. Who must they be? I wonder if they are, are um, employees of the boarding school at all, because what ends up happening is that the boarding schools would often farm out their students to other businesses to, uh, to get free labor and, uh, and to profit from that. And so sometimes children weren't even allowed to go home at all. And so what this photo then really exemplifies is the fact that the boarding schools were not there to educate Native, Native children. They weren't there to do that at all. What they were there to do is to prepare them and train them to be laborers and servants for white people. So there was never this, this ideal education that we think about today. There is just further discrimination and further uh, making sure that, these, that Native people did not have access to the same advantages and privileges that white people had at that particular time. So the boarding schools were modeled after military schools and military academies. And we have some precious uh, memories and stories from Harriet Sheldon Dover. And she recalls when she was at boarding school, um, they kept their shoes and their socks locked in the basement at the end of the day to prevent the girls from running away. And so imagine what type of environment it must have been that they had to lock up their shoes to keep them there. She recalls whippings that uh, she was strapped from her neck down to her ankles for talking her own language. And she said she never talked her language there again. She recalls constant hunger and fear and cold and a discipline that was, was brutal and cruel. In fact, her sister got tuberculosis while at boarding school, and Harriet was only allowed to go home when her sister died. This is, this is a, a shameful, shameful point in our history, and something that really shows how Eurocentric, remember that word, Eurocentric, or the belief that European culture or white culture is superior, continues to, uh, to impact Native communities today. So this anti-Chinese mentality um, didn't start with the Chinese. In fact, in fact, you're going to be seeing a lot of expulsions in the next few slides. Uh, the first of which is the Native American expulsion. And what happened in 1865 is that the city of Seattle passed an ordinance, that's like a, a, a local law, calling for the expulsion of all Native Americans from that area, kicking them out of Seattle, expelled from their home. So it is the Suquamish and Duwamish people who had made their home there and, um, and they are forced to leave in their canoes. And as they're leaving, they can watch, they can see their their villages being burned to the ground and destroyed, their longhouses burned to the ground and destroyed. And this is all in the name of white supremacy, that um, in fact, the only way that natives can go back into their homeland is if they are being employed by a white person. And so this even includes Princess Angeline, who is the daughter, the eldest daughter of Chief Self. Imagine how amazingly um, ironic that is, that the, that the daughter of the man for whom Seattle is named is not even allowed in this city. And so that happens in 1865. In 2015, the King County Council uh, really owned up to that um, to that shameful history. They officially recognized February 7th as Native American Expulsion Remembrance Day. So that is to commemorate this this history and this day and to uh, in hopes of healing 
in hopes of healing the relationships of the Native and non-Native people in the Seattle area. And so we see that discrimination reflected in the first non-Native agricultural practices that happen in Washington. Let's remember that since time immemorial, the, the cultivation and land management practices of land-based people is to not change the environment, but to protect it for future generations. The non-Native settlers brought in foreign species of plants and animals and harmful farming practices that forever change the environment. And so then forever change the ways of life of the tribal people and non-tribal people. And we see that land, that Judeo-Christian land-based value reflected in the goals of the farmers. One farmer said that his goal was to subdue the land, take the wild nature out of the land and profit from the soil. And so in order to do that, the farming practices um, irrevocably change and destroy large parts of the of our environment and and salmon habitat. We see that with in the 1840s farmers start using levees and those are like big dirt big ditch banks or big mounds of of soil to block up waterways to dry up wetlands so that they can be used for agriculture and what that ends up doing is destroying salmon habitat. We see that continuing in the 1850s with mining and logging and irrigation, which means taking water, diverting or pumping water from rivers and streams that are salmon habitat and using that water to, to irrigate crops on very dry land. And then, uh, and then so we have that there, that land-based or that Judeo-Christian land-based value then reflected in labor practices. So we see in 1915, Japanese workers start settling in central Washington as laborers. And then in the 20s, we see uh, Filipino cannery workers from Alaska and Seattle recruited to work the fields in the 20s as well. And then that continues then with in the 30s, beginning with the Columbia Basin Project to build dams dozens of dams along our major river and waterways to provide that irrigation for crops, further damaging and destroying the salmon habitats that we have here in Washington State. The first big group of non-white immigrants to the Washington State area were um, folks from China. They came here to work um, on the farms. Uh, many of them also came here for the gold rush, and then when that didn't work out, then they came up here to work on the farms. Um, it, it's, it's discrimination. Here we go. Um, the laws at the time actually allowed businesses to pay people of color lower wages. So the farm owners and the business owners took advantage of that. And not only did they... Um, hire a lot of Chinese people because they were allowed to pay them less money, but they used it against their white workers if the white workers asked for better pay or safer working conditions, if the white workers went on strike, or even if they complained. The owners could and would just fire them all and replace them with Chinese workers who were already forced by law to work for lower wages. It wasn't fair. So um, uh, instead of getting mad at the bosses who were, you know, really the ones in control here, instead of getting mad at the laws that allowed this to happen in the first place, the white workers who were being mistreated got mad at the Chinese workers. So between the workers feeling resentful and then the, just the plain old racism among politicians, um, they actually managed to pass a law called the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. This is before Washington was even a state. And I know that um, some of you folks learned about this, um, if you don't have me, um, a couple of weeks ago. So here it is again, the Chinese Exclusion Act. This law basically made immigration from China illegal 
for at least 10 years. That's what they said at the time. For 10 years, nobody else from China is allowed to immigrate here. Well, what ends up happening is that Chinese exclusion stays in effect in various forms. They didn't always call it the Chinese Exclusion Act, but it, it still stays in effect way, 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 way until like 1943 when we're about halfway through uh, World War II and we're allies with the Chinese. And at that point, they're like, yeah, OK, no more Chinese exclusion. But the laws actually stay on the books all the way through like the 60s during the civil rights era. They um, they weren't necessarily being enforced during that time, but they didn't take those laws away either. So back in 1882, once this Chinese Exclusion Act passes, um, people are happy. It's kind of ridiculous, but people are super happy about that. And then some of them figure, you know, now that it's illegal to keep people from China from coming here, we think it's probably okay if we go ahead and take the Chinese immigrants who are already living here and make them leave too. And that is what happens in a, in a bunch of United States uh, cities. Let's take a look at how this goes down in Washington. At the time, they referred to it as the driving out. And um, this quote says, um, numerous towns and cities experience groups of whites attempting to eradicate Chinese community members in violent attacks and expulsions uh, that they called the driving out. This happens in Tacoma, in 1885, just a few years after it passes, the mayor of Tacoma at that time is racist and anti-Chinese, and he encourages this mob to march into the Chinese section of town, to break into people's houses, to order them at gunpoint to pack up their things and leave. And they do. They pack up their things, and then these this mob marches these people to the train station makes them buy their own tickets to Portland, forces them on the train. Anybody who couldn't afford a train ticket to Portland had to take the freight train. So Tacoma, 1885. So Seattle looks at this and basically says, hold my beer. So as a result of this anti-Chinese mentality, we have something that begins in Washington state called the driving out. And this quotation here says that numerous towns and cities experience groups of whites attempting to eradicate or get rid of Chinese community members in violent attacks and expulsion they call the driving out. And so just a few years later, this happens in Tacoma in 1885. Um, we have the mayor who is racist, he's anti-Chinese, and he actually encourages a white mob to march into Chinese communities and they break down their doors and they hold them at gunpoint and they force them to pack their belongings to say, get out of Tacoma. And, and they have no choice. They actually have to do it. And so this mob then marches these Chinese people to the train station and they force them to buy their own tickets to Portland. And if they can't afford a, a ticket to Portland, then they have to take the freight train, which is a, a train that, that transports goods. And, um, and so this is what happens in Tacoma, 1885. Now we're going to see what happens in Seattle the same time. And as you can expect, it's not going to be too far from what Tacoma experiences. And a few months later, the same thing happens in Seattle, 1886. The Seattle mayor at least tries to stop the mob. He's not on the mob's side like the mayor of Tacoma was. But there were police officers who were on the mob's side, and the mayor was not able to stop them. This time they marched all the people with all their stuff to the docks. They forced them onto a ship that was headed for California. The mob actually took up a collection to pay for everyone's fare. So much did they want these people not in, in um, Seattle anymore. Then when the ship was full, 
and there wasn't going to be another one for a few days and there's still just a, a bunch of um chinese folks just standing there with their suitcases packed um so the mob starts to escort them back to their homes to wait for the next ship and then an even bigger mob shows up and attacks the first mob and there's fighting and violence it goes on for days the governor tries to stop it finally the president of the united states sends troops in to stop it it is just ridiculous and and eventually you know this racist mob succeeds and it, it gets what it wanted and they're um the chinese people have left seattle they've um they got what they wanted expulsion well about 30 years later um japanese immigrants start settling in washington state and other parts of the west coast like the chinese people they they start out as laborers on farms but some of them start to make enough money to buy land of their own and farms of their own and they start selling fruits and vegetables and they end up being pretty successful so around the 1920s the japanese farming has become so successful that there are some um, racist white farmers who just don't like that at all they didn't like the competition they didn't feel that it was fair uh, because they saw themselves as better than people of color so they didn't feel that so they demanded laws that would force the japanese out of the farming business and that happened um, in 1921 we get the alien land law making it illegal for Japanese people to purchase or own land in the state of Washington. And in the midst of all this, in the, the years before and after, the United States is also passing really tough immigration restriction laws, um, ending legal immigration from all Asian countries. So it started just with China, um, but now they're like, you know what, uh, Japan and, and South Asia and India too. Yeah, no, nobody, nobody from Asia can come here. So now that, you know, those avenues have been closed off, this kind of opens up the door for immigrants from the Philippines and Mexico. Um, Philippines in particular, because that was a U.S. territory, technically part of the United States. So um, uh, Filipino folks started coming here. Um, Mexico, let's take a look at how that worked out. Immigration to Washington state from Mexico um, wasn't very big at first, but it really took off during World War II. There was a labor shortage, and at the same time, because of the war, there was lots more work to do, and suddenly a lot fewer people to do it. We'll get back to why that was in a moment. Um, but Washington joined the Braceros program, which basically recruited men from Mexico to work as temporary laborers in the United States. Now they only took men. So these men had to leave their families behind and just come up um, by train and live apart from their families. Now, even though these new immigrants were really, really needed in Washington to help with the war effort, um, they still experienced racism they were paid lower wages than the white workers they had to live in these barracks with lots of people crammed into small spaces no indoor plumbing just an outhouse no way to get a shower like there was somewhere to go to the bathroom but there was no way to to bathe they just did not have that available to them they had to work long hours in all kinds of weather no breaks and in some places, um, they were actually fenced in and forced to stay separate from the rest of the community. So um, in Washington, this program only lasts from 1942 to 47. It lasted through the 60s in other parts of the country. And um, I'll have further information for you on Schoology to read about that if you're interested. But I want to get back to this question. Why was there this shortage of labor in the first place, why did they need the Braceros program? Why was there this shortage of labor in the first place? Um, first of all, because many, many of the folks who had worked on those farms had enlisted um, into, the, into the military and were fighting in World War II. 
World War II um, was going on before 1941, but 1941 was um, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, and that's when the United States got involved. Mm, let's take a little segue into World War II here, because this is going to be important. Here we go. Okay, we're looking at a map of the world, and I, I know that many of you have background knowledge about World War II, and I'm not going to go into a lot, a lot of detail about it, but I want you to look at all the countries here in red. In Europe, we have Germany, Italy, Romania, and Finland. And then in Asia, we have Japan. And these countries in red are what were called the Axis. These were the countries that the United States and other parts of Europe were fighting against. Germany is probably the one everyone's the most familiar with because that's when Adolf Hitler was in power, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard of him. But in these other countries, um, including Japan, there were other uh, kind of dictator types like Hitler who also wanted the kind of power that he did, um, and so they teamed up with him. In Japan, they were mostly focusing their efforts on attacking China and colonizing China. But um, right here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is Hawaii. And um, Hawaii was not a part of the United States yet, but the United States had kind of made it a territory. And right here on the island of Oahu, there was a military base um, called Pearl Harbor. So, um, there was a military presence there, and folks in Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and that is what got the United States participating in World War II. So, um, one of the things that made the bombing of Pearl Harbor possible is that there was a Japanese spy who gave information to the Japanese um, military. There was no evidence to suggest that any Japanese Americans living in the United States were spies. There was no evidence to suggest that at all. But people were still scared that there might be Japanese spies living among Japanese American communities in places like Washington State, Oregon, California. People were scared. Um, and people are not always their best selves when they're scared. So um, um, because they were so scared, they wanted the Japanese American citizens removed because they saw them as the enemy. Now we had a lot of other enemies in World War II. And there were plenty of German and Italian and Romanian and Finnish um, folks living in the United States, too. None of these people who um, were in America were considered dangerous. But Japanese Americans were. And so we have the Japanese internment. Um, this is a real shameful part of our history here, but, but here it is. Anyone, um, even if you had like a Japanese great grandparent, you were considered Japanese and um, they were notified to pack up their bare essentials and get ready to move. Soldiers came to their homes and marched them out of their homes. Um, we're looking at a picture of folks who came over from Bainbridge Island, so they were all marched onto the ferry, taken to the train station, put on a train, and sent to um, what they called an assembly area. It was actually at the Puyallup Fairgrounds, and they had to live in the barns at the Puyallup Fairgrounds um, and wait for more permanent quarters to be built. And once that happened, um, they were taken to these camps in Idaho and California, where they had to live for the rest of World War II. And here's a picture of one of those um, internment camps in Idaho. The living quarters were small. It was really crowded. You were sharing a space with like a, several other families. There were kitchens and bathrooms and laundry rooms. All of that was shared space. 
They did have school for the children and the adults could work, but they were not allowed to leave the camps. Um, interestingly, even though there was so much fear around Japanese Americans, they were allowed to join the military. And many of them did. Many of them um, went on to heroic status in the US military during World War II, but the civilians were kept on these camps. So, um, before the war officially ended, but when it seemed pretty obvious that the U.S. was going to win, they started closing the camps. But many, many of these people did not want to come back to Washington after that. Um, those who did found that their homes had been looted or destroyed or just plain sold out from under them. Really, really sad part of our history. So I want to reflect for a minute because we've talked about two major incidents in history in which um, white people basically went to where all the folks of another race were living and forced them to leave. We saw it in 1886 by an angry mob with um, Chinese Americans. And then we saw it again in 1942 uh, with soldiers with Japanese Americans. So let's think about this. How how was it so easy for these mobs and these soldiers to just go to one neighborhood, find all the people of a particular race that they were looking for and just remove them? Why were all the Chinese people in one place? Why were all the Japanese people in one place? This was not a coincidence. This is actually how real estate worked at the time, not just in Seattle, but in lots of places, in lots of places in Washington state. We're gonna backtrack a little bit because uh, here's a map of modern day Seattle. And when it was first um, um, settled as a town, it was really only like kind of like the Pioneer Square and downtown area. I'm probably even making like too big a circle here. It was pretty small and it was all pretty concentrated. Whoa, I'm having way too much fun with this red here. Okay, we're gonna stop that. So um, what happens is like in the late uh, 19 teens and in the 20s, we finally have automobiles. Cars are invented, cars are available, people have cars and they want to live further away from downtown. So they start moving up into these areas. Northgate, Ballard, what else? Queen Anne over here. Um, yeah, so they start moving away and builders start building whole new communities. Um, but there's something a little gross about it. A lot of these new communities that are being built, see here's an old fashioned car, you can just drive out to your beautiful house in Laurelhurst in your brand new car. And here's an ad for Olympic Hills when it was being created. But here's the thing, um, when they were advertising homes in Olympic Hills, here's something that was included in that advertisement. It says thoroughly restricted, restricted. Here it is again, this is a neighborhood up in Shoreline, it says, a restricted residential community. What do you think restricted means? Well, in this case, it meant restricted to white people. It's so gross, guys, I'm sorry, but, um, but there it was, it was built right into the law. If you bought a house in some of these neighborhoods, you were only allowed to sell it or lease it or rent it to white people. It says it right there. You're not allowed to sell it to anybody except someone who's white or of the Caucasian race. The thing that really hurts is that um, here's number 14 saying, hey, don't sell to people of color. And then here's number 15 that says, oh, hey, and also, by the way, you can't have animals either. You can't have pigs or cows or horses or any farm animals. So they're talking about non-white people in the same breath as they're talking about animals. It is awful. 
but this stuff stayed on the books for for many years. Let's take a look at the history of it. So here's the timeline. It starts right around here, and it does not end until all the way up here. We're getting close to Miss Jarman's lifetime, too, because this ended in 1968. I was born in 1969, so whew, it's been around a long time. In the 1950s, kind of after World War II, um, things were more prosperous. People had more money, and um, people had more money to buy homes. By then, Seattle, you know, was a pretty diverse city. We haven't heard a whole lot in this whole lesson on discrimination about discrimination against African Americans, and, and there, there was, but um, there simply were not that many African American people living here for it to ever explode into anything huge as it did in other places. But there were these racist laws on the real estate books, and so um, so that's how that manifested. So black people started noticing this when, you know, after the war and they've got some money and they go to buy a house and they have enough money to buy the house, but they can't, uh, the place won't take their money because they're like, I'm sorry, we have a, um, a race covenant, we have an agreement that we're not going to sell it to you. So people started, you know, protesting this. Um, Martin Luther King, the only time he ever came out to Seattle in 1961, spoke to some folks about it. People marched, people protested. It's getting to be civil rights era, so that's what people were doing. And um, in Seattle in 1964, people had an opportunity to vote to end this um, restrictive housing. It was called redlining because they literally drew red lines around the, the neighborhoods where uh, that were racially segregated. Anyway, it's called the Open Housing Campaign. All they wanted was um, for people of any race to be able to buy a house anywhere in the city as long as they could afford it. Seems reasonable. Um, a, a lot of people supported it, but a lot more people did not support it. It lost by tens of thousands of votes. It it was not, it yeah, it didn't even come close to winning. Oh, so embarrassing. Stay classy, Seattle. So that's in 1964. Um, what happens just a few years later is that um, Martin Luther King starts to become more popular and more well-known. His ideas start gaining traction. In 1968, when Martin Luther King is assassinated, um, the city of Seattle finally just says, you know what, enough. And so they don't put it to a vote to the people, just the city council passes it and um, they pass an open housing ordinance, which, you know, supposedly ends um, redlining and like racially segregated parts of the city. You can think about um, whether that was successful or not. Some maps show that it was. Some maps show that, um, that not so much. Anyway, I'll leave that there. Something to think about. And that is it. Yeah, heavy stuff. Are we ready to crawl under the bed yet? This was, this was some hard stuff to talk about and think about, but that's about 100 years of discrimination in Washington state history from um, colonization and reservations in the Indian boarding schools to the Chinese Exclusion Act and those expulsion race riots to the Alien Land Act to Japanese internment to um, um, racially segregated neighborhoods. Supposedly, you know, that that all comes to an end in 1968. It's the 60s. It's the civil rights era. Things are things are all better now. Um, we, we really want that to be true. We really hope that that's true. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, I think things are better. But is discrimination in Washington state truly over? What do we think about that? So um, that is the end of this part of the lesson. I'm going to have some other resources available for you um, to dive into any particular piece of history that we learned about today. And if you want to, I also want to pose the question, you know, um, is discrimination in Washington over now? How much better are things than, than how they used to be?
Uh, I'm interested to hear your opinion about that. Make sure that um, if you're going to do that, that you make a claim and then support it with evidence. You can use personal experience as your evidence for this just because we're doing a discussion. As always, please go back and rewatch it if it was too much too fast and didn't make sense. Please message me if you have any particular questions. And, um, and that's about it for this week. I will see you next time.